Hello and welcome to tonight's edition of the Berkeley Forum. My name is Oriana Ja and I'm currently the VP of events for the Berkeley Forum. We're so excited to welcome everyone to tonight's event with Sarah Ramos. Um, and to our audience, we firstly invite you to fill out the attendance form at https tinyurl.com slash Sarah Ramos attendance and to submit any questions you have for Sarah at tinyurl.com slash Sarah Ramos or S Ramos questions. Before we begin, um, the Berkeley Forum would like to take this time to acknowledge that our events and UC Berkeley's campus sit on the territory of the Ohlone people and that we benefit from the occupation of this land. It is important for, to us that we recognize this history out of respect for the Muekma Ohlone people who are still present in Berkeley and the Bay Area today. For more Native education resources on campus, we encourage you to look into the Centers for Educational Justice and Community Engagement. And with that, I'll hand it off to Ankita, our event manager for tonight. Hi everyone. Our speaker today is Sarah Ramos. Sarah Ramos is a filmmaker, writer, and actor. She starred on NBC's Parenthood and will star on HBO's upcoming show about the 1980s Lakers. During quarantine, she emerged on Instagram feeds with her DIY reenactments of cult favorite movie and TV scenes and pop culture moments called Quarant Scenes. She starred in and directed the 2017 web series City Girl, which she also starred in um, at age 25 after writing the script at age 12. Her latest projects include creating the autograph Hound Zine, directing an episode of Marvel 616, and producing and co-hosting the Runner Files podcast. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome up Sarah to the stage. I think you might be muted. This is truly the third time I've done that with Ankita and it's so embarrassing. Oh my God. Um, hi Berkeley, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Sarah Ramos. Um, I'm an actress, filmmaker, um, writer, artist, whatever you wanna call me. Um, just call me, haha. -ha. Um, I'm here to talk to you about working in the entertainment industry because I heard that some of you are interested in working in the entertainment industry. And um, kind of two disclaimers up top. One, I have barely spoken out loud to another person today. And two, um, I have a lot of information that I wanna convey. So I'm gonna talk at a fast clip and I believe in you, you can keep up. So um, basically I thought I would share about my own professional experiences. And I feel like there are two ways to do that. One is like, what Ankita already did, you know, list a traditional resume, you know, I I've done this, 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 and this, the kind of things that your mom might tell a family friend who she ran into at a grocery store um, or at a barbecue. But I think that there's a lot more to say. Um, there's a lot more to my story. And I'd imagine to your stories than a list of credits. And actually, I think that um, most of the work that I've created myself more recently uh, really involves reflecting on and unpacking what like the actual experience of working in entertainment is like the desires that motivate you and the feelings good and bad um, that successes and failures bring, bring up. Um, and I really like to focus on stuff that sometimes it can feel like we're not really supposed to talk about um, because it can feel like um, we're only supposed to talk about our list of credits and things that make us look super fancy um, and enviable and whatever, yada, yada, yada. So um, a little bit about me, I'm gonna use some visual aids. Like most people who enter the entertainment industry, um, I started out as a fan and uh, you might not even know who they are anymore. But in the early 2000s, I was particularly a fan of two teenage twin entertainers named um, Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen. Here they are. Um, they had movies and TV shows and Walmart products and video games um, and magazines. And they even hosted a cruise, um, which I convinced my parents to take me on and which is where I took this awkward photo. Um, I would say like meeting them, you know, was the highlight of my young life. <laughs> and I kind of like to think of it as how I learned that um, I could connect with the people who I watched on TV um, 
in person instead of being separated by a screen because here they are and there I am looking wow excited um and when I got home from the cruise uh I convinced my parents to uh let me start acting professionally at like 10 years old 10 or 11 um which is how I started auditioning and eventually ended up on like various tv shows there I am. so um I should say that since you're all Berkeley students, you know, maybe you don't have like overly agreeable parents who would let you do bizarre things like go on a Mary Kate and Ashley cruise, but that's okay because I'm sure that your parents are super weird in their own way. And I want to empower you to really reflect on that and get specific about how they're weird um, and what they've passed down to you to make you weird um, without meaning to maybe, and how that's informed your worldview. And then I want you to tell us about it. Like basically I recommend um, digging through your metaphorical childhood closet for the most embarrassing forgotten obsessions and interests of yours that you don't want anybody to know about and really lean into them, unpack them, tell everybody about them. Um, why because i have done this in multiple ways um for instance my visual aids um in 2020 i published autograph hound which is a zine that i collaborated on um with the new york pop culture pop art museum called um think 1994. uh so this is it but it's probably easier for you to see if i uh show you on my screen share uh, so the zine begins with photos, the photo from the American Ashley Cruise, of course, and then it kind of tracks how this photo um, and starting acting led to an obsession of mine at a young age uh, with taking photos with celebrities. I was acting in a TV show, as we've said, and I was going to premieres, I was invited to go to premieres like the celebrities I took photos with, but that didn't stop me from, you know, being a fan and getting my picture taken with the people I wanted to take my picture with. Um, I think that I definitely got away with it at the time because I was a kid and I could have just left it at that, you know, nobody was saying, Sarah, share all these photos with the world, but uh, by organizing them and, displaying this archive of photos, um, which have continued on in various ways till this day. This is Chris Jenner, me, Jennifer Lawrence in the background, my friend Tavi's cut out. Um, by organizing this and displaying them, we even held an art show. Here's Tavi and me with that same photo at the art show, as well as some others. Um, we did that in New York earlier this year. I really forced myself to engage with these photos and, um, the meaning of the fact that they exist, you know, what's going on? Okay, this is me and photo bombing the cast of Riverdale, me with a photo of me photo bombing the cast for Riverdale. Um, so I think these photos are funny, one, but two, um, they also raise a lot of philosophical, even existential questions, I might say, you know, like, okay, if, if I was somebody who um, people could see on screen, well, why did I care about taking photos with people who I saw on screen? And actually, why would anybody, even people who aren't on screen, care about taking photos with people that they'd, they'd seen on screen? What's going on there? Um, and I also remember when I took these photos originally, I was really proud of them. I mean, look at that pride. Um, why? Hmm. And uh, then later on, when I got older, I remember then being a little embarrassed of them and ashamed. And what's going on there? You know, I personally think after a lot of, of, of contending with this, that um, there's a contradiction at the heart of them, because I was a kid who wanted to be a celebrity. Um, and I think I wanted to be a celebrity because I thought that celebrities, you know, were better than me. Um, you know, they looked happy. They were always having fun. It seemed they looked good. They dressed well. Um, you name it. I thought they were popular and beloved, you know, really getting deep. I think I thought that celebrity being a celebrity would be like an escape from the annoying parts of being human, like loneliness and confusion and trauma. Hmm. That's Nicole Richie um, in a wig. But 
believing that being a celebrity meant not being human and being like better than me kind of meant that even though even when I was on TV, um, I could never feel like a celebrity because the whole point of a celebrity was that I thought they were not human and they were better than me. So if I still felt human, I couldn't be a celebrity. Does that make sense? Um, if not, don't worry. Of course, it still raises even more questions. For instance, where did I even get the idea that celebrities were better than me in the first place? I was a child. You know, I had to have learned it somewhere. Who knows? Maybe people were marketing to me the idea um, that celebrities were better than me in order to sell me products and cruises. I don't know. Or maybe I learned it from movies and TV shows and books and magazines that I was consuming at a very young age. Um, actually, now that I mention it, um, another project that I made that is specifically about unpacking those messages that I learned from the media during my childhood is my web series, uh, City Girl. And I want to play you an episode of City Girl right now. Hit it, Ani. The following program was written in 2003 by a 12 year old girl. City Girl. Excuse me, sir. Sorry, but we're closed. I uh, think you're open. Actually, we're closed. Do you always believe everything you read? It'll only take a minute. Oh, oh. great a migraine. Hi, Trish. I'm really sorry, but I have a really bad headache, and I have all this work to do at the store, and I really can't talk right now. Okay. I'll call you tomorrow. Get off of me. Hey, you're the one that wanted to... Hi, Casey. Hey, Mon, Aaron. Go ahead. It's not like we have any customers. What are you talking about? We... Hate each other. <laughs> oh. Oh. <sighs> Headaches again? They're getting worse and worse, aren't they? Thanks for showing me that thing. No problem. So, where are you headed? Lunch with Matt. I thought you guys broke up. We're still friends. Yeah, right. <sighs> Bye, Mon, Aaron. Please take care of the store for me, okay? No funny business. Sorry, Emily. Traffic was crazy. I have this headache that just won't go away. It's okay. You already ordered? Do what you want. You were right. Oh. oh! Excuse me, waiter. Can I have an aspirin? Must be pretty bad. Migraine. You should see a doctor. You wouldn't want to miss my family's annual ski trip. Oh, yeah. You should see my mom's doctor's friend's son, Dr. Foley. Here, his card. I already have a doctor. Trust me, you'll like him. Besides, your doctor isn't helping. Here's the card. Dr. Foley. That was so trippy and funny to watch with a delay. Um, if you guys had that, it goes full speed, typically. Um, but that's the gist of it. Um, basically, for more info, when I was 12 years old in 2003. Um, I was acting in my first TV show. And yeah, I wrote this romantic comedy script called City Girl. Um, I had recently seen and become obsessed with Legally Blonde. So I wrote the script for Reese Witherspoon to star in. But what happened was that no one ever read the script. Um, the script was not produced and Reese Witherspoon did not star in it. Uh, actually no one besides 12 year old me 
ever knew that it existed. That is until many years later, um, when I found the script in my literal childhood bedroom closet, you know, hidden amidst Mary Kate and Ashley merchandise. Um, and the City Girl script was incredible. It just wasn't incredible in the way that I had intended it to be when I was 12. Instead, I felt like it perfectly encapsulated kind of how a uh, media addled 12 year old in 2003 viewed um, modern womanhood. You know, the lead character, Casey Jones, she was 28 years old, but she was really insecure about her age. Um, she loved eating salad. As you saw, her ex-boyfriend ordered her a salad and she was happy about that. And um, she couldn't get rid of her ex-boyfriend. And she was also developing an inappropriate relationship with her doctor who comes in later in, in the show. So when I was 25, um, in 2016, I produced the script without changing a word of dialogue, which is what you saw. And um, the goal was to bring my 12 year old vision to life. And I think that doing it was funny, um, but again, it raised some deeper questions. You know, hmm, why did a 12 year old girl imagine that a 28 year old woman would be insecure about, about being close to 30? Where did I get that? Um, why did I believe adult women were riddled with migraines um, or find themselves in these inappropriate love triangles. Or as you will see later in the series, um, why were some characters so flamboyant and obsessed with makeovers? Was this coded as gay? Where did I learn that um, stereotype? Hmm? And I think like as a child, I was absorbing all of these messages from the media and then regurgitating them out in this writing. And I really could have been embarrassed by a bad script that I wrote when I was a tween and just not shown it to anybody, um, you know. But I think that by making it and putting it in the spotlight, um, I was able to, you know, have a laugh at at <laughs> what, I, what was going on with me and also acknowledge the weird messaging I received and give myself the opportunity to connect with other people who had written crazy stuff when they were kids or had their own obsessions with TV shows or celebrities or whatever, obs whatever obsession they had. And I was able to transform something embarrassing into something fun and celebratory. And really quickly, since this is a talk about working in the entertainment industry, I should note that uh, a fair amount of people in Hollywood advised me against making City Girl. One person told me that if I wanted to be taken seriously as a writer director, I should make something more traditional. Another person told me that Tim and Eric had already done stuff like this, so it wasn't original enough, enough to do. Um, so I decided to make City Girl, but like had zero expectation that it would be helpful to my career. I was just like, just going to be fun. I just have to do it for me. And this was partly a good thing because I then had zero expectations on it. I wasn't like thinking anybody was going to watch it truly. Um, but also those people were wrong um, because the people who watched City Girl, nobody, not one person complained that it wasn't original. Um, and then it did kind of lead people in Hollywood to taking me more seriously as a creator. And it introduced them to like this deeper, more unique side of me than they'd understood before, even though weirdly I had been on TV doing traditional work in the entertainment industry at the time that I was writing City Girl. Um, so an example uh, is that earlier this year, an editor from the LA Times reached out to me to ask me to contribute to the first issue of their style magazine because she'd liked City Girl. And she suggested that I could annotate the script. Um, I wanted to do something different, but I liked her annotation suggestion. So I pitched a different idea. Like I'd remembered um, that when I was applying to colleges, I had written an essay about being the runner up to play Jenny Humphrey on Gossip Girl, um, the original, not the reboot. And I remembered I'd felt like really heartbroken at the time and that I'd written like a super dramatic essay about it. And I thought I was gonna have some fun laughs uh, exposing that essay and, you know, gently poking fun at my young self who was kind of butthurt about not getting the job that she wanted. But actually, and this is an illustration from the essay, um, in writing the essay, I realized that there was a lot more to the story that I, than I remembered. 
basically it turned out that during this one month, um, February, 2007, that I auditioned for Gossip Girl, my family really went through a, a really intensely tragic time. Like there were three deaths in our family, our dog and my Holocaust survivor grandma and my uncle who died as a result of drug addiction. And I had completely blocked that out of the timeline. I don't think I had the emotional skills to process that. Um, and I just focused on what I'd always used to cope, which was media, TV, and celebrity. I just remembered, oh, I didn't get Gossip Girl. That was the only thing. Um, so while I originally thought I was going to like, it was going to be funny. Um, once I knew the full context of the story, it didn't seem like right to be making fun of my young self anymore. I needed a little more compassion. So instead in the essay, I, um, reconstructed a timeline of that intense month, um, by using my actual journal entries from when I was 15. This is like me looking pretty miserable on an audition around that time, uh, as well as notes that my mom took about what auditions I went on and what feedback we got and my, my actual college admissions essay. Um, here's another photo of me where my head's cut off, but it got turned into uh, this illustration. Um, and the final essay ended up being way less about Gossip Girl than like a coming of age story where the show was a backdrop for like some lessons about desire and death and trauma and sex um, and sexuality. And I really learned a lot from writing Grief Girl, which it was called, and it brought up a lot of stuff that I'd always wanted to express, but didn't know how to kind of like before I'd explored some stuff about celebrity. And now one of the things that I wanted to explore was the pressure that I always felt, you know, starting when I was a teenager um, to wear makeup and dress a certain way, which I felt like was being asked to perform sexuality in order to get ahead in my acting career. And I'd go on auditions and they would always kind of subtly be like, you should dress sexier. Like I'm wearing heels in this. I was miserable. Um, and I wasn't comfortable with it and I couldn't do it. Uh, and this old experience that I had growing up um, as an actress kind of reminds me what it feels like to just be on Instagram today. Um, like, I feel like there's all this weird unspoken pressure to look and act and dress a certain way, kind of like a Kardashian or an influencer to, you know, get attention and make money and be successful. There's a vibe. Um, so I pitched to the website Bustle that I would write an essay about doing a photo shoot um, where I dressed up like a super sexualized influencer. Um, and they said I could do that, which was really exciting. So the thing is that when I started writing that essay and doing the photo shoot, I realized that to be a super sexy influencer, you don't just have to have a photographer and hair extensions and styled clothes and contoured makeup and face tuning. You also have to have, you know, a body, 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 very specific Kim Kardashian type body that I didn't personally have. So again, I turned to media for guidance. I was watching a lot of RuPaul's Drag Race at the time, um, and I decided to do influencer drag. Um, and they called the essay, am I an influencer yet? So to me, this essay and photo shoot really continued in the vein of transforming something uncomfortable that you might usually keep hidden, like a lifelong discomfort with feeling pressured to perform sexuality, um, into art that is external for me and fun and an opportunity to connect with others while also kind of being healing. Though I will say that, um, I don't think making art is a substitute for therapy. Remember that? Um, and for me, I think, oh yeah, here are some more photos. We did like fake products and this. Um, I think an interesting through line and takeaway in all of these projects um, and the other ones I'm excited to work on is that I think, you know, I got into this industry <laughs> for a little bit of the wrong reasons. I wanted to be famous, um, but really, I don't think I understood what that meant at the time. If you look at um, the way that our culture treats celebrities, I don't, it's not with love like I thought. I thought, I thought it was, but I, I think what I really, really wanted was connection, you know, to tell my story and have people hear it and respond by other people telling their story so I could hear them and feel connected. And by really um, unpacking and, and focusing on, um, you know, 
what really happened and learning that lesson and you know how how I got here, even though sometimes it was embarrassing and unpleasant, um, I, I really ended up getting to do that and, and have success in that way. It just looks a little different from how I'd imagined it. Um, so in closing, I just want to say that uh, you never know where your projects are going to lead you. And most of the time when I do my best work, I'm really just following my curiosity um, without expectation. And one last example of that is that ironically, even though I've, as I've told you, you know, I've been working my entire life. I think the thing that really got people's attention and probably is what got me invited to speak with you today is a video series that I made um, where it was just on social media and um, I was reenacting movies and TV shows, scenes from movies and TV shows on social media. Um, and I started doing it because I thought that the stuff people doing on TikTok, the stuff that people were doing on TikTok was really cool and creative. And I was like, I want to do that. Um, and then during quarantine, I just needed something to do to, to, to do, you know, um, and then people ended up really liking it. And that was honestly very surprising and incredible because I, well, I like to say that if I had really known that there was an audience for me reenacting scenes and pretending to be movie stars and characters that I was obsessed with. Um, I would have done that a lot earlier because that's honestly what I would do in my bedroom before I even started professionally acting um, when I was like nine. So I think one takeaway here at least is um, if you like something, then there's probably somebody out there like you or like me who will like it too. And you will never know until you try and put yourself out there and look, you might make a fool of yourself, but who cares? <laughs> and on that note, um, I want to end with one of my favorite reenactment videos of me and Chloe Feynman. She's on SNL uh, doing the iconic courtroom scene from Legally Blonde. Um, Miss Wyndham, what had you done earlier that day? I got up, got a latte, went to the gym, got a perm, and came home. When you got in the shower? I believe the witness has made it clear that she was in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Um, Miss Wyndham, had you ever gotten a perm before? Yes. How many would you say? Two a year since I was 12. You do the math. You know, a girl in my sorority, Teresa Marcinko, got a perm once. We all tried to talk her out of it. Curls weren't a good look for her. She didn't have your bone structure. Oh. But thankfully, that same day, she entered the Beta Delta Pi wet t-shirt contest where she was completely hosed down from head to toe. Objection! Why is this relevant? I have a point, I promise. Then make it. Yes, Your Honor. Chutney, what is it that Tracy Marcino's curls were ruined when she got hosed down? Because it got wet? Exactly. And isn't it the first cardinal rule of perm maintenance that you're forbidden to wet your hair for at least 24 hours at the risk of deactivating the ammonium thyglocally? Yes. And wouldn't somebody who's had, say, 30 perms before in their life be well aware of this rule? And if, in fact, you weren't washing your hair, as I suspect you weren't because your curls are still intact, wouldn't you have heard the gunshot? And if, in fact, you heard the gunshot, Brooke Wyndham wouldn't have had time to hide the gun before you got downstairs. Which means that you would have had to have found Brooke Wyndham with a gun in her hand to make your story plausible. Isn't that right? She's my age. Did she tell you that? How would you feel if your father married someone who was your age? You, however, had time to hide the gun, didn't you, Chutney? After you shot your father. I didn't mean to shoot him. I thought it was you walking through the door. Order, 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 order. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, Miss Wyndham, what had you done earlier that day? That's it.
stunning. Thank you, Sarah, so much for that wonderful address. At this moment, I'd like to welcome Ankita Namdar, our moderator for tonight, up to the virtual stage. All right, thank you so much for that talk. It was great. We're really excited to have you here. Um, and just as a reminder to the audience, if you wanna ask Sarah Ramos a question, please submit it to the audience Q&A form linked in the video description. Uh, so for my first question, since there's a lot of UC Berkeley students in the audience, um, I wanted to ask you about your own time as a student at Columbia University. How, if at all, has that experience and your major impacted your career? Great question. Um, I went to school a little bit later. I started uh, when I was 21 and I went to Columbia. Um, and I really wanted to study something that was not film because I had been in film and entertainment my whole life. Um, and I really wanted a break. And um, I decided to study creative writing. Uh, I did so prose writing, like short stories mostly. And I remember one of the first times I had to turn in a story, I had to take a nonfiction class first. Um, and I totally underestimated uh, the amount of time it would take to write a good story. And I was like finishing my first draft, like right before it was due. And I had to turn it into everyone in the class to take home and read and give me notes. And it was so embarrassing. Um, and I learned <laughs> that I really have to give myself plenty of time to revise and stuff. Um, so that was my huge first lesson. And then, um, I really appreciated that I took that, did that major and went to college in general and broadened my horizons. Um, I did stuff like dance classes and Pilates. Those were just fun. Um, and, uh, next year I'm putting out a short story that's written in prose fiction. Um, and I totally feel like I owe that to uh, my time in creative writing workshops at Columbia. Yeah, thanks for sharing. That's really exciting. Um, and before you went to Columbia, you were uh, you started acting at a relatively young age. And recently, Alison Stoner, who's a former child actor, spoke out about the negative impacts that entering the industry at such a young age had on her self-image and physical well-being. Uh, so what impact, if any, did the experience of getting into acting at a young age have on you? Oh my gosh, Ankita, so deep. Um, I think I think I addressed a lot of that in the talk, and I, I like to really talk about that in um, a lot of the stuff that I work on. I like to try to find a way to, as I said, process that uh, personally um, for my own mental health and emotional well-being um, privately, and then kind of take what I've learned or what feels important to share um, and turn that into some sort of art piece, whether it's writing, um, like the essays I've written or photo shoots or, um, you know, I think even my reenactment videos are a channeling of that original enthusiasm that I always had. So I like to um, balance out kind of the good and the bad. Um, what remedies, if any, do you think exist for young actors entering the industry right now? Oh my God, hard hitting. Um, <sighs> I think mental health resources, going to therapy. Um, it's interesting because I kind of like to say that the entertainment industry can be a stressful, dangerous, um, very intense place for anybody. Like it's not like um, adults are fully equipped to um, handle all the the competition and the long hours and there's so many things that happen um, in Hollywood that are, you know, on the news right now. Um, and it just is so much more intense if you're still developing your identity um, as a kid. So I think the same kind of um, 
resources are needed no matter what age you are. Um, and also across um, professions. Like I think we in America tend to associate, tend to connect our identity with our job. And um, I think it's really healthy to not do that and to try to find a way, say, I am not my job and um, focus on what it's like to be a person and the humanity of the experience, which um, I hope you guys kind of got from that talk too. And like talking about kind of finding your own identity, you've like previously expressed that filmmaking has been an outlet for you to really embrace your unique identity. What differences, if any, have you experienced while exploring your identity in filmmaking versus acting? Interesting. Um, well, acting, you know, is very specifically like performing dialogue and performing a character that uh, somebody has written. Uh, so you're not expressing yourself, which when I was a kid, I think that was really uh, helpful in some ways that I could um, explore emotions or stories that weren't happening to me. They were happening to somebody else, this character. Um, and I could kind of get to know things about myself through acting as other characters. But I think it that's definitely a way that you can um, distract from um, who you are and eventually, you know, that's going to catch up to you or you're always going to be running and uh, and distracting from it. So I think that writing and making um, your own projects, you know, that's just a really straightforward, like that's you channeling your own voice, or at least it has been for me. And for me, I literally have um, made projects out of of repurposing diary entries and photos I took when I was a kid and being like, okay, here's, there's one way I could tell this story. Um, but what if I go deeper? Um, and using that as a way to even get to know myself from when I was a kid, because there was so much going on. I couldn't necessarily have put into words why I wanted to take so many photos with celebrities when I was a kid, but I can like do the work now to, um, ask. Yeah, and you, you just mentioned in your answer and you mentioned in your talk that you worked on a lot of uh, projects now that you directed and written yourself. So how, if at all, has the rise of streaming services and internet-centric content contributed towards your shift away from the bigger studio productions you worked on in your earlier career? Um, I think it the internet has contributed a lot to that. Um, I think if, if I had been born a little bit later or had not gotten into professional acting, like I probably would have been making YouTube videos. Like I was always making stuff. And sometimes I'm like, well, maybe that would have been better even than like being on traditional TV shows um, because I would have found that earlier. I think a lot of the time, the, the first thing you want to be if you're interested in storytelling in in movie making or, or tv or whatever is you're like oh i should be an actor because that's the first thing you see and you don't really see the behind the scenes um and even so like even though i was acting in uh professional productions i still ended up gravitating towards the internet because the stakes were felt really low and um I just wanted to express myself. And in order to, you know, do a professional TV show, you have to go through so many steps. You have to pitch stuff. You have to get executives on board. Um, kind of like with City Girl, for example, like there were so many people in Hollywood who were like, this is crazy. Um, <laughs> we're not, this doesn't make any sense. But a, a web company, like an internet company, gave me money to make a series on the internet. And then people were able to see it and understand where I was coming from. So it's, I think there's the stakes are low and it gives you the chance to experiment and have fun. And like, all you have to do is look at TikTok to see um, how creative people are. Like, it's insane. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for sharing. Um, I wanted to kind of move from your work to like broader trends and recent events that are happening right now in the entertainment industry. 
So last week, as many of us have heard, an accidental shooting on the movie set of Rust took the life of a cinematographer and injured the director. As a director and actor yourself, what steps, if any, should parties involved in the filmmaking process take to prevent any other incidents like that from occurring? Um, yeah, that was a horrible, horrible tragedy. Really, really horrible. Um, I think one, I know people are talking about saying there should be no guns on set and I don't see why there should be guns on set. Um, you can create the same effect in post-production uh, with special effects. And even if it, you can tell they're special effects, like the stakes are too high, like nobody should be being shot at their job. We make entertainment. Um, that should not be happening. Like that shouldn't be a risk that you're taking at work. Um, and, you know, I think that story of what happened on that set is somewhat connected to um, a larger story that has been uh, happening and being told in the film industry around IATSE, which is the union that represents crew members, um, you know, everybody from grips and electric and camera people um, to wardrobe, hair and makeup, like most people who work on a set and you just don't see them um, on screen. And, you know, they've been they they voted to authorize a strike if they couldn't reach a deal with the people who run all the studios to give them reasonable rest hours um, and to give them a, a living wage and all these, you know, really basic demands that shouldn't even be up for debate, um, if you ask me. And I think that's kind of that's kind of, a, that's a huge issue that people are grappling with now is like the humanity, what it, what it's like to have, to be a human working in this industry. I think we expect a lot and we expect it to be done quickly. And, um, we focus on the glamour and, um, the shiny celebrity stuff at the detriment of the actual human experience. And I hope that people are starting to, um, stop doing that because it's not, it's just not worth it. And it hurts everybody. Like it hurts everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective. I think myself and a lot of like audience members definitely appreciated hearing that from you. Um, and unfortunately for the sake of time, this is going to be my last question before we move on to questions from the audience. Um, so going back to your work a little bit, you've played a really diverse range of roles throughout your acting career so far. What roles, if any, do you look forward to exploring in the future and why? Um, that's a fun question. Um, I want to play a villain. I just think that would be really fun. And I think that sounds really basic, but um, I think that that sounds fun. And I like, I like doing comedy in acting. I've mostly done dramas. Um, and in my own filmmaking work, I mostly make comedies. Um, so I'd like to mix that up. Yeah. Maybe another web series. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for answering my questions. We're now going to move on to audience questions. Um, so for the first one, Ellen asks, uh, I'm a huge fan of your short Fluffy. What was the process like of getting the cast and crew together? I'm looking to film my own short and I want to make sure that everyone gets the best out of it. Oh my gosh. Hi, Ellen. Thank you so much. Um, the process with Fluffy was interesting. It was paid for by a clothing brand, BB Dakota, um, which was really cool. We just had to use BB Dakota clothes. Um, which was super easy to do for them to give us a budget, but like, you know, making stuff is so expensive. It's crazy. Um, and I will say that years and years ago, my shirt, my first short film, um, I paid for myself with my co-directors and writers and we made it for way less money. Um, and we called in favors 
uh, with a DP that I met at a party um, who ended up being incredible. And we had our family members in it alongside professional actors. Um, and that was a really fun experience that I am really proud of. And I think um, um, proves that you can make something awesome with very little money too. And um, I think the most important thing is to plan and shot list ahead of time, know what shots you want to get um, and prepare, 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 just kidding. Um, but prepare. All right. And then um, Anna asks, what advice do you have for female identifying students looking to get into directing? Um, hi, Anna. My advice is you should do it you should definitely do it. Um, I think for me, directing is so interesting because I originally, you know, wanted to be an actor and I was never like, I want to be a filmmaker, but, um, I'm kind of a control freak and I, you know, would write things. And I, uh, I had to be kind of encouraged by people to say, if you <laughs> basically, if, if you, you're going to do all the work anyways. And then, um, if you have somebody else direct it, they're just going to ask you all the questions and you're still going to be directing, but you're not, they're going to get the credit and credit was something that I didn't come into this industry caring about at all. And it's taken some lessons and time <laughs> to be like people, that's what people see. Um, first and foremost, they're like, oh, so-and-so directed this, or they really take that really seriously. And it's important that you, um, you ask for credit. <laughs> I, I feel like that sounds like one of the, that sounds like a really obvious basic answer, but um, you should be credited for your work and everybody should. And sometimes that doesn't happen and you should stand up for yourself. That's great advice. Um... So Anonymous asks, what was your experience of directing an episode of Marvel 616 like? Um, hi, Anonymous. Um, my experience directing Marvel 616 was really fun. It was, we filmed all of it in early 2020. We went to the New York Toy Fair um, and we went to the Hasbro headquarters and the Funko headquarters. It was about Marvel toys. Um, and then during quarantine is when we edited it. So we edited it all via zoom, um, which was, you know, slow and required a lot of patience because typically when you're editing as a director, you'll be in the same room with your editor and you'll be able to say, Oh, go back, play that back one second. Okay. Try it like this. Okay. No, that didn't work. Try it like this now, but over Zoom, you're like sending that information over email. So you can't do like, let's just try this really quick. And then, oh no, it didn't work. It's like, you really gotta <laughs> work on your communication um, and be clear and decisive. So it was a journey that I think nobody was expecting, um, but I'm really proud of how it turned out. Yeah, I love Marvel. That's awesome. Um, also, another anonymous question, but can you tease your next Reese movie for the reenactments? Oh, yeah. So thank you for asking that. Um, so I'm doing, I, for some reason, just felt like God spoke to me and told me that I needed to reenact every scene from Reese Witherspoon's filmography. And I DM'd Reese and told her to give me till 2030. So I've I have time um, because we got other projects going on too, but I just started editing this and I want to turn it around fast because um, of the Halloween atmosphere and theme. Um, I want to do just like heaven. If you know that movie, Reese plays a ghost. Um, Reese plays a ghost. <laughs> Did she respond to your DM? Yes. She said she was speechless. <laughs> and she said that there were a lot of TV movies um, that she'd been in <laughs> like years and years and years ago. And there are, and I do plan on um, reenacting them. Okay. 
Um, also another <laughs> anonymous question, but uh, this person said, all your work is incredible. Have you considered directing a feature film on the subversion of the beauty industry or do you want to explore a different narrative? On the what of the beauty industry? The subversion. Oh, the subversion of the beauty industry. Oh, that's interesting. Um, actually, I, uh, well, yes, I, I have considered that. And I'm really excited for this. Um, it's like a novella. They call it a short story, but to me, it's like longer than that. It's, I think it's a novella, but I will be reading it. Um, it's going to be an Audible original. So you'll be able to listen to it on Audible next year. Um, and that is a little bit about some subverting the beauty industry. So, and maybe we'll down the line, perhaps end up adapting that for the screen. That's awesome. Okay, so unfortunately for the sake of time, this is gonna be the last audience question, but I had to ask this one because I'm a huge Taylor Swift fan myself, but um, recently MTV posted a clip of you talking about your favorite Taylor Swift tour. What's your favorite Taylor Swift song and album of all time? Oh no, you can't do that to me. <laughs> That's so brutal. Actually, well, I think uh, I'm a big The Red Tour head. And so I know that we're about to get the Red Era Taylor's version. So I'm really excited for that. I think that's like next month. Um, and I can't wait. But I think possibly her one of her best songs, if not her, but I think is Invisible String which uh is on folklore right i think you know that one's really good yeah no disagreements here um okay so well that's all the time we have thank you again for answering all of our questions i'd now like to invite um our vp of events uh oriana ja back up for some closing remarks thank you Thank you and a huge virtual round of applause to our, moder to our moderator, Ankitha, and to Sarah, our incredible speaker for such a wonderful event. As a token of our appreciation, we would like to present a poster designed by a member of our communications team, Ashley Kwa. Um, she, it's designed specially for you and we hope that you enjoy it. Okay, I think you were muted, but- <laughs> I said thank you. Thank you so much. All right, um, next. We'd like to quickly recognize some individuals from the Berkeley Forum who have worked on this event. Thank you to Ankitha for being both the event manager and the moderator, uh, to our tech lead, Ani, for uh, handling their technology, our communications lead, Sam, and our poster designer, Ashley. Um, and then to our audience, we have some more Berkeley Forum events coming up. Our next event is going to be on Monday, virtually on Facebook Live with Barbara Liskov. She is a Turing Award winner and MIT professor and has really interesting things to say. Um, then to, to close up, we'd like to thank you all so much for spending your evening with the Berkeley Forum. Um, we encourage anybody in the audience uh, to fill out our feedback form with speaker suggestions or suggestions for improvements to our event at tinyurl.com slash tbffeedbackf21 or to scan the QR code on the right. Um, and to keep up with what we're doing, feel free to like us on Facebook or to visit our website at berkeleyforum.org. Um, and then lastly, if you are willing and able, we ask that you do help support us by donating to our Venmo, linked below. Um, any amount goes towards helping us put on these amazing events. Thanks again so much for spending your evening with us, and we hope to see you at another event soon. <laughs>